Hi, um, we're back with another um, IG Live, um, and this week I'm very happy to have Alice Arnold with me, uh, photographer, educator, filmmaker, um, and she is responsible for uh, many of the sort of uh, iconic giant step um, photographs um, from the early days and also um, the Groove Academy shows as well. Um, and I'm very pleased to have her joining me. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot about photography, um, uh, graphics, and also um, how she, uh, her techniques, her influences, um, and also her insights into um, uh, New York culture because she spent a lot of time um, within New York club life and culture too. Um, so we're just waiting on, on Alice. I see Genji's joined us and a bunch of other people. There we see, I see Alice now, okay. So I'm gonna invite Alice. And she is, there we go. Hi, Hi Alice. Hi. That, that, was, that was seamless. <laughs> yeah, we, we, did, we did a test uh, earlier in the week and it, and it was, um, we, we were learning, so that's why we do the test. So Alice, welcome, so Thank good you. to see you. Um, as I was saying earlier, I mean, Alice um, you know, is, is an amazing photographer, but uh, she uh, captured uh, the very sort of early essence of what we were doing uh, with the Groove Academy with Giant Step. Uh, back in the day and um, we for, for those um, people who've been following us on on Instagram and social media and have been into the um, been in 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 the vault uh, you you'll see a lot of Alice's sort of iconic pictures with especially been highlighting this week um, so I'm really pleased that you were able to do this with us and, and also uh, you know people learn about sort of like who you are and also, you know, how you do it because, uh, you, you, you know, your art and everything. Um, so, um, as always, um, you know, I think the best way of really understanding how someone becomes, um, a creator like you, we really have to understand where you came from and, and, and how you got to the point that you, that you are now, uh, and what your influences are. So can you tell us a little bit about, um, you know, where you grew up um, and, and how you came into photography. What, 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 was, what was that inspiration for you? You know, my earliest, thinking back of this earliest sort of inspiration about visual construction really was architecture. And I grew up in one of these, what's considered like the second generation California modernist uh, spaces. And I'm very aware of the architecture from a, as a young child, looking at buildings and being in spaces. And part of being in space, of course, is light, because light creates space, right? So, so these were very, very early. I'm talking like, you know, five, six you know, years old, being very conscious of this and thinking about it and incredibly influenced by it, uh, by architecture, particularly California modernism. Um, and I, it's something I talk about to my students today, even like this idea about space and two-dimensional space where are things where are we putting things in our compositional space and I remember photographing from the Groove Academy live shows when I really first started to photograph live shows and still thinking about that where are things going in space and why and kind of always thinking like oh well will the musician move in this way will they sway here and then I'll get the right composition that I want so architecture and light were are key for my um, and and about making work. You, and so you're talking about sort of the uh, Southern Californian modernism. Um, yeah. Just talk a little bit about that movement. Who were some of the um, who were some of the leaders in this movement, um, and and where were they from? Because uh, not all of them were actually Californians, right? No, of course not. Yeah. Um, it it sort of uh, starts with Frank Lord Wright coming to L.A. around the 1920s to build, I think it was the Barnsdale House, his first home when he built in L.A. And he brought along an assistant with him, Richard Neutra, who was Austrian and was very much aware of what was going on at the Bauhaus, which starts in 1922, and Le Corbusier doing his work. I think Neutra might have even worked with Le Corbusier. And 
Neutra brings along a friend of his to work with him named Richard Schindler. And I absolutely adore Richard Schindler's homes and spaces. And he had, one of his homes is a museum now on Kings Road in, in um, West Hollywood. And um, then after World War II, there's a big boom of people moving to L.A. and Southern California um, uh, economy. And there's a lot more homes built. And then several architects really start to build interesting homes there. And that's called the second generation. Esther McCoy writes about that in her book. Uh, so Ray Cappy is one of those people. And Bruce Davidson. Uh, th there's many, many more. And then the photographs of those architecture, particularly Jules Schulman's work, really beautiful and, of course, iconic that most people think of, you know. And and which part of LA did you grow up in? I'm from, I'm from West LA, right. um, uh, a little neighborhood called Beverlywood. Of course, um, yeah. So yeah. And was any of that architecture in Beverlywood as well? Did, did you? Uh, not not. I would say so much. I mean. I grew up um, first at the on the edge of Beverly Wood and in a building that my father had built that was architecturally significant. Um, Rex Lottery was the architect, and um, so yeah, I grew up kind of in these spaces. It was very interesting to me about light and 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 spatial uh, a way of forming spatial dimension. I find that a complexity in them. And, and, that, and how old were you when you picked up your first camera? Um, we had a dark room in the house growing up, so I was, oh, I was wow. always around yeah. photography. And and who was so who was the photographer? Why why did you have a dark room? It was your was uh, one well, of your my parents? father had, had right. a, a dark room. Um, uh, he wasn't a photographer, but um, we had we had a dark room. So yeah, I was I was always kind of knowledgeable about photography, doing photography from um, I I don't exactly know eleven ten, you know, <laughs> yeah. And at that point, were you taking your camera everywhere with you or was it just, was it, when did you kind of know that like, wow, this is like my, this is going to be my, my thing, my profession? Yeah, much, my... much later. Um, I, um, I was uh, at UCLA studying history and I took some time off and I went to London and I just had time and I had my camera with me and I, I was really then became interested in thinking about photography as a path I could do and then when I returned to LA to finish school at UCLA I started working for a photographer um, Leon Lacache who um, did a lot of music and fashion and different things so I was I was working from a, as a, in a photo studio from like 18 on and, and a student and um, really learning the ropes yeah. And what was your what was the your camera of choice back then? Obviously, everything was analog. Uh, did you have a particular camera that was your sort of like your love? You know, like, yeah, I still. You know. I still or did you have a camera. few like, you, you know, you kind of have to decide which, <laughs> you know, which one is your. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was like save up the money, you know, mm -hmm. Finally, I bought a Nikon, a manual Nikon. They, I mean, they, they had cameras back then that had um, not autofocus, but yeah. you know, electronics in them. But I bought a manual one. And, and um, I would, uh, the other big camera I, I craved, I wanted, I couldn't afford it, was a Hasselblad, which later I bought right. a used Hasselblad in 1966. I still have it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and also while you were growing up, obviously music was a big influence on you. Talk a little bit about how music came into your life and, and you know, what that, what that was for you. Wow. Yeah, you know, I, my memories of music go with car driving, you know, riding in the mm -hmm. car. And that, of course, is something in L.A., much more so when I was growing up in the 70s than now because L.A. has tons of traffic jams, so you don't move that, that much. But there was, you know, out of the car, go down to the beach and um, listen to music. And the radio was a big influence. The radio had a lot of Motown and soul. What was this? And, what was it? Do you remember the stations you were listening to back then? Yeah. No, I would have been too young to choose it myself, you know. <laughs> It was, you know, what other, yeah, somebody else would have chosen it. I, but, but I particularly, Motown sounds were th very much a part of what I remember, uh, you know, influence. And then for me, it was like someone, you know, interested in reading and history. It's like, well, if I'm listening to that music and I like it, where did it come from? Right. Who are so these people? So yeah. back, right? Peel back. And saying, you know, like Led Zeppelin was popular with people when I was younger, I mean, older people than me, I just heard the music. I didn't, I wasn't able to buy anything at that stage, right. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. People don't really understand that it was expensive to buy music back then. And it wasn't just something that we could just, 
you know, buy out like now you, you know, I want to listen to 30 records or hundreds of records on, on, on a DSP. I, you can just listen to it. But back then it was, you had to make a decision. I'm going to buy this album. And you kind of had to live with it for a long time because that was all you had. Yeah. It's, yeah. Um, right? it's a lost or, art. Yeah. Or, you know, you're 10 years old. You can't even get to a record store. Right. right. <laughs> like, you know. So someone else was buying things and, you know, was listening. Um, but yeah, you know, you hear things like, let's say Led Zeppelin and they're like the popular cool band or something and to me it was like oh well where did this music come from you know you start to read music criticism uh and and right you would then there's they, there's hints there's clues oh there's there's blues music well let me yeah. you know listen let me let me try to understand that so very much i was influenced by early blues music and then into jazz music kind of tunneling around from there and um looking at the images looking at the images that was um being used to um package and market Jazz and blues music was very influential to me to develop a visual style. Yeah, I mean, because the other great thing that we had back then was the real estate on a album. Um, and so you had, I mean, the photography, uh, the artwork, uh, the gatefolds, the inner sleeves. I mean, you could just, you know, and that is, unfortunately, that's a, a I think we lost that art with CDs because it was hard to do it with CDs. But now I think we've totally lost that art. Yeah. Yeah. That that that's 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 kind of problematic about thinking about how do you c consume music in a way because there was always this visual art side to it, yeah, uh, and beautiful design often. Yeah, and people, I mean, I, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I bought a lot of albums for the artwork or the photograph originally, especially a higher player. So I really, then I realized I actually liked the music as well. But <laughs> <laughs> there were there were definitely you know the artwork was that you know you judged a book by its cover in many ways yeah, oh yeah 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 and what did you study at ucla i studied history <coughs> what, yeah. what um and i i was um no, no particular specialty but I, I guess if i had i i was particularly interested in intellectual history of the 19th and 20th century hmm. so that's the primary what i was i was thinking so that that's where you're sort of curious that and that also comes from your curiosity of hearing music and then wanting to discover the anthropology and the history behind that music so you could really get into it and 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 understand what was going on you know it, yeah it was, you yeah. know I, I would also and this takes our conversation a little bit to an aside no, that's but, fine um, I, I was very interested in mo modernity and modernism mm -hmm. and i and i still am and you know but in, by the 80s of course it was such a postmodern world i felt a little bit out of sorts but 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 those roots of the 19, later 19th century or even into the 19th, leading into the 20th century, very interesting to me. And, and on a design level, too, because the Bauhaus, again, is starting in 1922. Yeah. And that's very much the modernity that's thought about modernism. And, and of course, it, you know, by the 1960s, 1970s, it's sort of maybe worn out of course. And then the idea of postmodernism develops in architecture yeah. and, you know, television and other other fields. But but that sort of intellectual strain you can say from hegel and kant you know uh, mm -hmm. leading leading forward is very very big influence on me and and, and from from ucla um again you, at that point you weren't thinking i'm going to become a photographer I, I presume i might be wrong um what how did you because we met in you how did you end up in new york i mean what was what was the reason to bring you to new york well, I, I did start working as a photographer and trying to get on that path while I was still a, a UCLA student, even though I was studying something very different. Um, and uh, I just, you know, after I, I, I'd been an assistant, I worked on all sorts of interesting things, traveled around. You know, there was a cool club scene in L.A. also. Um, there was a great club called Flaming Colossus. And we had friends who were musicians there and we would be like dancers with them. And so there was some things happening there too, but I, I wanted to start a career in, as a photographer and I thought my options would be better in New York where there was actually music I was really interested in because I started to hear some rap music. Um, and I just found, and the, the, the song I heard, it might've been on radio, um, was a, a, a mix, a beat by Mark 45 King. 
and I really liked it. And of course, why did I like it? Well, it had James Brown in it, you know, and the JVs were there, and there mm -hmm. you know, and I thought it was really interesting. So sort of was chasing that music a little bit coming to New York and um, wanting, wanting to photograph um, in, in, around music business more. LA at the time was very more maybe established music, but also very, um, Film. Sort of sports yeah. were fashion yeah. at that mm -hmm. time. And I, I wasn't going to be a fashion photographer. I, I just had no interest in it. So, so what, what year did you come to New York? 1990. 1990, which is the year that we started. The summer of 19, June 1990 was when the Groove Academy started. And uh, September 1990 was when Giant Step started. Um, so we, we, when we were sort of like talking earlier, um, I, I asked you, how did we meet? Because I don't. I actually remember, and I see Jonathan's on here. Jonathan remembers, but <laughs> I, remember? I, I don't remember. It. I mean, I, you kind of were always, oh, there's Alice, you know. Like, so do you, do, what, what's your recall, uh, recollection of, of how we, you connected with the Groove Academy and Giant Step? Well, you guys were at SOBs, and I, I knew SOBs, and probably I'd been going to, was going there for some shows, and maybe I was hired by the times to shoot something there as well at that point. So I might've seen flyers or met you guys there. I also now just remembering, I work for a very small English magazine, a wonderful magazine called Soul Underground. Did of course, you, you? yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so they yeah. might have introduced us in some way, Dave Lubitsch, you know, I, I don't know, or something. That, yeah, because they, they were one of the first um, magazines to write an article on, on Giant Step, but, you, but I'm sh we must have met before that because um, you, the, the first show I remember you taking pictures at was Blaze, uh, which was the third Groove Academy show because the first one was Leon Thomas meets the JBs, second one was Bobby Bird and the Funky People, James Brown's Funky People, which we have no photographs from that show, so you obviously weren't there. Um, I wonder if uh, I was there though, and then I had to meet you. Then, because I remember asking you, "Can I take photos of your shows?" Then you were probably at that show, and it was like we probably said, well, "Would you have a camera? Take them now." <laughs> no one's taking yeah. pictures. So. Yeah. So, so the first show was Blaze, which was yeah. in August of 1990, um, and um, actually those those pictures are on the. Um, uh, in, in the vault, uh, that beautiful pictures of Blaze, and one of the very rare shows Blaze ever did uh, live. Um, and then y you were saying that you actually you were at the very first Giant Step parties yeah. as well. Yeah, and they were exciting because you had you brought in live music with with DJ stuff, and you know it was it was you know there was so much music that I I, I liked, and it was a it was a neat um, it was a great vibe, you know. From um, first moment. Yeah. So I, I think that, you know, um, you, you know, we talked we talked a lot about music being an influence on you. We talked a lot about history being a big part of you, your journey and then obviously photography. Uh, and when when I look at the sort of photography that you were capturing uh, back then, I think those all come together in many ways. So, you know, like, you know, and it was what we were trying to do as well. We, we were very influenced by, you know, the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the Blue Note, the Chuck, the Chuck Stewart's, the Francis Wolfs, um, you know, so talk a little bit about how that sort of jazz photography that, you know, was, it was an influence on your style. I was so aware of those photos, particularly Francis Wolfe and Chuck Stewart and Herman Leonard. Now, of course, there's other people also took really important, great photos. But I mean, I remember like I had their books and I was really studying them. And they, I just thought they were beautiful images that they also spoke something about that music. So we can talk about, you know, visual music. I'm actually working on a documentary with some people right now about that has to do with visual music. So it's still oh, wow. a thread for me um, of great interest. And um, those those pictures, you know, kind of, I, I hear the sounds when I see those pictures, you know, I know those albums, so many of them. So I was, uh, when you when you started, you and Jonathan started doing those shows, that was really exciting to me because I hadn't been able to see these artists or many of these artists, you know, I knew them, I knew the albums. And I wanted to make 
images of them because they had meaning to me. You know, I wanted, I wanted to put, make images that, that also reflected that sort of what, what that soul, what that rhythm meant. And again, that's what I'm thinking when I talk about like space, we have a frame, right? And, and, you know, we have a frame size, we have our visual composition. And where do things go within that space to create rhythm, visual rhythm, tempo, contrast? And um, I, I, I really felt like I was so thinking about that, making those photos. And still, if I'm you know, doing photos, I think about these things. But I, I really felt so much at those, particularly the SOB show, the space was, I knew the space well. The, it was a really good lighting job, generally. Really nice, you know, lighting, stage lighting to think about. Sound how to, wasn't always great, the, but the lighting was good. Yeah, the lighting was good. <laughs> the stage wasn't too high for me, I'm Definitely sure. not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That stage was short, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I would elbow my way to get to the front, you know, because I'm short again, people would be taller. <laughs> and um, found my spots, found my angles, you know, and, and I, I, I was always trying to use the lights that were there and the positioning of where people were on stage and thinking about, you know, how, how are people moving and swaying and trying to create some visual rhythm that, that um, reflected or responded to what I was hearing. And, and I just had such reverence for, you know, the music. I, I think, Chuck Stewart, I think when I was an intern at the town hall, um, I think I went to his apartment for some reason. I think to, we, we needed to purchase a picture um, of his, um, uh, to, for, for town hall. And, and, I remember, I mean, he was like, he'd taken pictures of Billie Holiday and Charlie Parker, and he was like sitting in his apartment. I think, if I remember correctly, he was on East Houston, very close to the old knitting factory. Oh. And it, I was like, I couldn't believe that this icon, like whose, whose pictures I knew was, was living the way he was living. And it, and it kind of actually reminds me a little bit of, uh, you know, somebody who passed away, uh, the, you know, just a few days ago, uh, Ricky Powell, um, you know, the same thing, you would go to his, his basement apartment on Charles street and literally his beastie boy and Basquiat pictures were kind of like, just, I mean, so, you know, uh, it, 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 it's amazing when you when you think about sort of the I, the iconic pictures and then actually the, the people who, t who who took them. You know. Yeah, yeah. Ch Chuck Sir, by the way, has a great Instagram account. That is oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I definitely need to follow that. Then. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, so you know, you're in New York. Um, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're taking pictures for us and obviously other, other things as well. Um, what were some of your sort of like style Bibles or influences that were inspiring you? Um, because again, we had no internet, you know, we couldn't Google something. We, we, we had to discover, you know, and research. So what were some of those things that, you know, the face was like the huge sort of style Bible for me, but design Bible as well. Um, magazines are really important um, in ways maybe they're not as much now, but I guess, let me say, why, why move to New York from LA? Like the magazines, the publishing industry is here in New York uh, for, the, for the United States. So there were magazines here, um, you know, where I wanted to work for, um, be involved with. And, but the face of course is, is English, was in London, but I was looking at the face from LA days and so inspired by the design. And again, then that made me always want to reach backwards because the face, Neville Brody dividing, was you know designing the face then and he was so influenced uh, by the Russian constructivist movement. And he really brought forward a lot of interesting design ideas and knowledge from um, that era of the 1920s, again, 1910, 1915 to 1930s. You know, uh, so very influenced by, by, by them. Yeah, I mean, I think I think all of us. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I was still in England when the face came out. I mean, came out once a month. It was if you thought you were anybody, you had to buy that magazine. And fashion, design, culture, uh, photography, um, pretty much e everything. And um, you know, uh, when they actually wrote an article on Giant Step and used one of your photographs. It was uh, when we were at the village gate and Roy Hargrove was in the picture. 
I mean, at that point, I was like, well, we, we can we can retire now. I mean, that's it. We were in the face that we don't need to do anything else. Unfortunately, it wasn't the case. But, you know, that's how uh, important that magazine was to anybody who had any, um, you know, who thought they were any in any way part of culture. And especially when you moved to America, there were only a few outlets that would sell it. So you had to get to work very hard back in those days to stay globally current, you know, it was, yeah. Yeah, I remember hanging out in Tower Records where they had the magazine section. Yep. I, yep. I couldn't afford to buy it. Yeah, I'm <laughs> just like, you know, like going through, you know, like, <laughs> where do you feel to go, uh, are you gonna buy that? Yeah, of course, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so, I mean, um, you know, you were shooting our Groove Academy shows, um, you know, some of the most iconic ones, that, you know, was the, the Bootsy Collins pictures you took are incredible. Um, the George Clinton ones, um, the average white band, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the um, uh, Ginger Baker pictures are I mean, you know, and, you know, and unfortunately, a lot of these people are no longer with us. You know, I looked at the picture we posted of uh, Gary Mudbone Cooper and Bernie Worrell, uh, Gary Schneider, um, Gary Schneider, sorry. Um, you know, I mean, these are icons who, who, have, who have passed away. So, uh, you know, your, your capturing of them is was, was amazing. Um, but you also were coming down to to the parties, to the club. Um, capturing those metropolis pictures, um, you know, the musicians um, and, and the people, because um, they really created that vibe. What was that like for you as a person with the camera going through the crowd and sort of taking those pictures back then? I guess there was some sort of evolution for me. Like I was shooting the live shows and I mean, I didn't start doing that really until I came to New York. And then I, started photographing in the clubs. I, I had an, some assignments to do some of that, like at um, Sound Factory for Soul Underground and other magazines. I worked a lot for European magazines. Um, you did the, the Straight No Chaser pictures, the iconic. Straight No Chaser pictures, yeah. I did, a, I did a house sound, a couple of house sound stories. So I think that introduced me to the these, these nightclubs and I, I found it interesting. And what I found interesting, again, it was youth culture. I, I wanted to make work about what was, you know, my peers, what was going on. I like, I, I was interested in rhythm, you know, and, and dancing and sound. So you heard great sounds at the clubs, right? And there's rhythm, but it was also to me the dancing. And I was very interested in photographing the motion, the movement, the dancing, and again, making a composition that, that was, was speaking towards that. So um, I guess, yeah, when you, when you guys started doing giant stuff, I wanted to photograph down there as well. And then I started working for paper magazine, photographing their nightlife columns and also the DJ columns and other things. Did a lot of work with paper. But those nightlife columns really kept me working the beat. I mean, I worked in the day, too. And then I was out at night photographing quite a bit, all sorts of clubs all over in New York. Uh, it, it, it's very hard. I mean, again, I'm not a photographer, but um, you've got people dancing, great movements. But it's, very, it's, a, it's a very hard um, skill to capture that, to, to capture the the energy of the movement in a still. Mm. Um, and there's many times that, you know, there'll be somebody break dancing. And I'm not saying about your photography because you, you managed to nail this. I want to understand how you did, but someone will be you, doing you a head spin or break. a little bit for me. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, somebody I heard you break dancing and then. Yeah. So, so somebody could be break dancing, but when you take the picture, because it's a still, it basically looks like they're just standing on the head. You, it, people don't really, oh, Sue Kwan has joined. Wow, okay, another yeah, photographer, iconic photographer. Um, yeah. uh, so how do you manage to capture that energy when you're taking a still? Yeah, yeah right? I mean, you, you gotta condense a whole bunch of time into you know that one, that one frame. Of course, journalists are trained to try to think about that. What is it going to be, that single photo? That's also an interesting, I think, point to think about now when images move around with 
more fluidity than they used to and we, we see a lot more images so you, you said thing is you're a photographer they're going to run one image i got to deliver one great image <laughs> to that magazine or newspaper yeah. or something right and now we, we post and people post tons of images all the time but i'm still thinking like how do i this experience that i'm in right now how do i encapsulate or encapsulate it into one great image you know how do i get that right and you'll get a part of it hopefully if you're successful and that 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 defines a sense of a successful image you, you gotta like yeah try to absorb the vibe and 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 of course a room is big and there's different things going on um i i i, I again was trying to always place people in the frame in certain in certain places and i guess work with angles a lot to get this sense of the energy and the motion you know to try to have vectors angles the other thing that's interesting is look, looking back at some of these pictures is the fashion. Um, and in a way, the, the fashion hasn't changed that much. Yeah. Um, I, I'd say the biggest thing that I noticed is the clothes were a little baggier back then, but the dress sense was pretty much the same because streetwear had just started at that point, you know, like that early nineties, maybe some of the brands have changed, but it was, it was moving away from the more sort of formal wear to just sort of like the streetwear vibe. Um, so, you know, what are your thoughts on sort of like the, the fashion back then? Cause also that the clubs is where the trends were starting as well, fashion wise. Yeah, looking back at images, just to get like a lookbook sense of, of, of clothing, I, I think people, the styles are, are still very fresh and, and, and look great. You're right about the baggier, the sense about, yeah, t-shirts being bigger, you know, and things like that. But you get the sense, yeah, the, the streetwear brands and then the, the beginning of, of sort of marketing on the t-shirts a little bit more, the hats and things, yeah. right? And sneaker culture becomes even more. That's More. a very good point. Yeah, it's sneaker culture. Because, I mean, it wasn't like ubiquitous that people were all wearing sneakers back then. A lot of people weren't, especially in the clubs, but not, not everybody. Shoes were still part of it. And also jeans. Um, you know, not everyone would wear jeans. Um, again, a, a lot, but it, it wasn't as ubiquitous as it, as it is now. Um, uh, actually, uh, Andrew uh, just mentioned Triple Five Soul. Who, yeah. Were, yes, that you, that was. We did a story you know, with him. Yeah, yeah, for Straight yeah. No Chaser. That's right. Yeah. Um. So, you know, you you started. You you talked a little bit about working um, with paper um, uh, uh, on the nightlife column. Can you um, actually? And somebody just mentioned that clubs would turn away people wearing sneakers. You know, I it know. was like no sneakers, no hoodies. Uh, thank you for reminding us that, that, yes, that used to be very, you know, dress to impress, you know, like the way we sort of all, you know, dress now, that was unacceptable to get into clubs, you know, so. But not was, giant step, right? I mean, so there was different clubs, yes. right? And... We, yeah, we, we, you know, we, uh, you know, and, and, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was lucky enough to have uh, Mac and Jonesy uh on, on this as well and you know it, it they picked the vibe it, it wasn't about how you dressed obviously, obviously you know you, but it was more picking somebody's vibe if their vibe was right they were welcome if their vibe was wrong it didn't matter if they were designed it out you know in fact that was probably a reason not to have them in but uh, yeah um, but you, you, you were working for a uh, paper magazine, which we, you know, we talked about the face being a, 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 a culture and style Bible, you know, paper magazine definitely was for, for New York, um, especially downtown New York. And, you know, we used to every month make sure that we were in the listings and, and, and all that stuff. Um, what was that experience like? Because that was when there literally were parties to go to every day of the week. You know, like weeklies happening every day of the week. Yeah. There were so many parties and um, there wasn't the internet, right? And, and I was right. like, somebody called you or, or basically, I think often you saw flyers. You went to a record store or a bookstore 
you know, you on, on the weekend or something because you wanted to find out what was going to happen? Or maybe, did you guys do ads in the Village Voice or anything like that? Uh, for certain, for certain for events, for shows, we would do an ad. Uh, um, and re we'd only do an ad for the club if um, if we were doing like, something quite big but to be honest with you we didn't really the people who read the village voice were not the target audience for the club uh the, the club was much more the flyers word of mouth uh how people would um be able to find out about it but the village voice was but there was the village voice there was um time out there was and there were a couple uh, New York Press. I don't know if anybody uh -huh. remembers New York Press. Um, you know, th those were sort of like the, the, the weeklies that would give us the information, you know. Um, but um, what were some of those clubs that um, you, um, you, you would, um, you enjoyed going to uh, as part of your assignment back then? Sometimes I went on my own that I knew of something or a friend asked me to go to a club and photograph. And sometimes I was assigned through paper, the editors at Paper Magazine. And I went to a wide variety of things. And I liked, I, I liked to just these different scenes and the different fashions you would see and the different types of music. And the 90s had a really rich musical um, amalgam happening because there were house parties and house music. And then... Um, you split off, you know, Deep House and, right, and there was like soul and groove stuff, you guys, and Soul Kitchen and soap parties and other parties. And then there were, um, I guess, I don't know if you, some may be more knowledgeable to speak about, like, how did techno really start? How much it broke off from house and other forms of electronica? And then techno starts to fragment, you know, into all different sorts of music. And, of course, Mac then starts the Concrete Jungle Club. Yeah. So there, there were bass, a yeah. lot of different scenes and it's amazing new york supported all these different scenes on different nights there's so much I, and i look back at my rolls of film which i'm scanning now for a book project and it's like half the role might be on one club and then there's someone another you know i was just probably just running around trying to get as much as possible into one night um and then the, then the rave culture um started in the sort of like the, which, which I, I felt brought in a much younger audience um you know that that brought that that brought younger people to to club culture, um, and um, you know one of the comments I just seen, which which is, I totally agree with, there was a lot of crossover back then as well, um, where you would I mean I think a perfect example of that is the Jungle Brothers Girl I'll House You, where they were a hip hop band doing a house song, and back then there was you know, hip hop, we're going to house clubs, house clubs, you know, it, you know, DJs were playing together. Uh, it wasn't until I think sort of like later on in the nineties that things became a lot more sort of separated and these sort of like real distinct genres came, came about. Yeah. I, like there, there was, like the house clubs were really strong and powerful dancing. I, and I, I always really appreciated that. And people were really were just dancing all night. And then what I always loved the giant stuff was that there were some live elements and live music that, that came with it. Um, and people, so there was, there was just a, just a really rich experience that felt creative. I mean, it, it to me, it wasn't, um, about debauchery and you know getting drunk, I was I needed to be very much in control of photo taking and being able to be yeah. sharp and focused, right? But um, but there there was uh, it was a it was a great you you met your peers. There was a, a creative feeling, yeah, uh, in the clubs and these are your spaces um, to. But I and I think you know that that goes back to the fact that in order for you to know about these things you had to have some sort of a thirst for knowledge in culture in music in creativity it wasn't just again google it and you'll find it you had to dig pretty deep uh and you know that goes back to the music in order to be a dj you couldn't just say oh i i'm a dj you know because i you know i downloaded all this music you needed to own the records to begin with you know, you needed to have those rare songs. 
you needed to maybe create those songs yourself. So it, you had to work so much harder, not only to be in the industry, but also to go to these things as well. And I think that's why, um, you know, you were able to, um, you know, get the sort of people who came because they, they were special in themselves. The audience was very special because they were, they, they were thirsty for knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's a, that's a, a great way to put it. Um, I, I didn't think of that so much before, but it is, there was a curation to it, of yeah. course, and that you would have, as someone who was promoting these clubs, creating these spaces and these experiences. And yeah, how did people find them? You know, certainly very different from them today. Though I, I teach college kids and they go out to clubs and spaces and they consume music and, you know, they're passionate about, about different things too. Yeah. Yeah, as, as they should be. I mean, because I, 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 I'm not a believer in, in sort of back in the day conversations. Yeah. Um, and I think things are, you know, the time is now the, you know, but there is a difference in how you just, dis- I, I think discovery is different to what it was. Um, that That's the, the biggest difference. Um, and it, it's now it's a lot more egalitarian. Um, you know, anybody can do it. Back then, if you didn't know, you just didn't know. And you lived a life just not knowing. You know, you would literally, you know, you, you, in, in New York City, there were people who didn't know anything about the underground club scene or, you know, um, you know, the, it, a lot of it was driven by the um, LB, LBGTQ community, um, you know, African-American, Latino, uh, and then you'd sort of have on the fringe sort of like a few Europeans, you had your Japanese and you had your inquisitive Americans, you know, and, and that, and then everybody else just, they just didn't know about it because it wasn't, it was nowhere near the mainstream. Yeah. yeah I mean, underground culture is always very interesting when you're a part of that scene, right? It, yeah. it's, it's small and it, it tends to be a hothouse, right? Of, of people very, very vibrant and, and, and have the similar, similar ideas and a lot comes out of it. I, I, I think that's, that sort of history is always interesting, you know, and, and you can go back to cabaret culture or the Dottist in Zurich, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and take different cities at different time periods. And there's these underground sort of hothouse scenes of the people, you know, um, yeah, hanging out, doing things. So talk a little bit about sort of like, what you've been some of the stuff that you've been doing because you 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 lived in hong kong you you're teaching you've been making films you know so let let's hear a little bit about your um you know your journey as well yeah i i I worked as a commercial photographer in new york city till about two early 2000s and then i just stopped i just stopped my my photo business not not stopped being doing photography work uh, photography you know uh, is very meaningful to me but um i i went to graduate school and i i kind of refocused to make um and where did you, you went to graduate school in new york right yeah new york, i went to yeah. a program called uh, integrated media arts at hunter college a uh, very nice mfa program and um from there also starting to teach and and um just work on uh things that were longer form you know, because with doc film, you spend longer on it. And, and you have this component of research that I really enjoy. And more images, right? It's not the single shot that you're trying to tell the story in the single shot. Um, and, and the whole editing process is so intricate and, and fascinating. And again, it's about rhythm. So, yeah, I started doing more doc films based on uh, looking at the, ver- but similar ideas about the urban environment and um, visual culture. So, yeah, that's been doing a lot of that work. And um, yeah, I was in Hong Kong and different cities, and but you know, a lot and here. How, too. How, what was it like living in in Hong Kong? Hong Kong is a really unique city. It's kind of sad right now what's happening to people in Hong Kong. So I'm following that news, and I know people there. Um, there's an whole independent media scene there. There's a great art scene there and design scene. Um, I didn't find it as much music. As, as New York, well, New York is a great music town, you know. Right. Um, but the, but the city itself is 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 just spatially very interesting, you know. It's this island, and then the, the other part of the, the um, Kowloon and the new territories, and you know the inter, the interrelation. I mean, I'll take the the boat, the Star Ferry across is always lovely. 
Um, but it, it's a very visual culture, and that, that's why I was there to study. Because I think that visual and, culture. and talk a little bit about the documentary that you do you've been making because I think you know that on a visual side is a very interesting topic that you've been working on yeah. oh I'm actually I'm working on several documents okay right well go ahead yeah. <laughs> um, overloaded with projects but I think the one I mentioned that you're thinking of is uh, I'm just I'm not um, I'm not the driver of it I'm not I'm not the director it's on um, Joshua White's um, light show and, and so it's about visual music. Um, and that's a 60s scene. So we're going back to this origins almost of, oh, of the, visuals sort of the, with the, rock the, music, the, with music. So where was he doing those lights? Was he doing them at the Fillmore or? Yes, he, yes, yeah. the Fillmore East. Um, there's people on the West Coast doing the Fillmore West, the West and the people yeah. light artists. And he really innovated with his group of people, his team uh, at the Fillmore East for a number of years. And and those 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 images are, a sort of the what you think of when you think of that 60s rock and roll mm -hmm. you know so he was the person you know thinking about those ideas and those images and what those images look like and it was live it was you know improvising with light to make images along with the music so yeah i'm working with a group of people on a, a documentary about that and we were recently filming um in la with somebody who uh collects uh, artwork of somebody who was an influence from the 1920s to the 1970s on these light artists oh, who's working wow. with light. Um, uh, so yeah, there's a there's a big history of people working with light and thinking about music, you know. And of course, you had Kandinsky and Synesthesia. And, you know. So yeah, I mean, music and 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 visuals always have a very intricate, interesting combination. Yeah. And especially when they're, they're they're mixing it live with the music. So the the light, you know, now they have all the pre-programmed lights at concerts, and you know, it, it looks it. I mean, incredible light shows now. But if you go the next day to the same show, you'll they'll have the same cues. Uh, but back then, it was like like the visual people were in the band. They were like, is there any uh, footage of sort of live concerts um, that they, from the film or East in, in this film? Oh, um, well, this group of people, Joshua, Josh White, he, he's formed a whole new group of people. I don't know if he's on the um, Instagram or not. He, he wrote, he wanted to join. <clears throat> he's working with a whole group of people and they're still making, doing things. I mean, not right now, but with the pandemic, but we filmed some stuff at the Skirball. In the, at NYU recently, mm -hmm. and uh, and he's he's been at I think MoMA and Tate and yeah different things, uh, so there's definitely still people doing that work. Um, and uh, I was gonna say something else. Sorry, that went out of my mind. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, doing something live with it, and it's not um, it's not an algorithm, you know. Like you said, it's not pre-programmed. You're you're responding to it and 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 with with the music. So so th those things have, I think, when you're in the audience there, people feel it. You know. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the urban messaging uh, as well? Um, you said you 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 made a film or you were making a film about urban messaging, and I think that that's really fascinating. Um, I made a well one film I made. Maybe you're thinking that is a film on street art. Right, and that was called "To Be Seen," and I was very uh, again visual and looking around. Of course, it has its roots in graffiti, which you know we all were influenced by, um, and seeing that like street artists starting to put up work. In New York City, had a great street art scene in the sort of early two thousands, and a lot of it was very political. It was it was you saw a lot of messages about um, the Iraqi War and you know um, Bush era. So uh, I thought it was very interesting and I, I made a, a film on that. And um, Swoon is in that film. And she just, I just read, she has some interesting art exhibit at uh, Brooklyn right now, in the Brooklyn mm -hmm. waterfront. And her art is amazing. But some, several street artists, uh, Mike DeFeo, uh, who also did some club, club graphics at um, Masquerade, Viscato is in the film and the Wooster Collective, Mark Schiller. Um, so yeah, like, well, how, how do we try to put our messages out on the street without advertising? We, we, we see so much advertising, it commands our attention, right? The attention economy and that space, those spaces are very expensive, right? You know, mm -hmm. but like who owns the sky? Why, why does this group get to have this billboard or this giant right. screen flashing these messages? So the street artists, 
we're kind of taking back the streets, you know, uh, which has a very graffiti sort of sense to it, sensibility, right? Like, let's can we put alternative messages out there? Can we can we reclaim some of the streets for a different type of ideas, a different type of messages? I, I find that very powerful. So, um, when it, so I made a film about it. Yeah. Um, and where can people see that? Um, it is on streams on a independent film site called Ovid, Ovid TV, like the Metamorphosis, the um, Greek yeah. Ovid. And it's on educational distribution on Icarus. And Icarus and Ovid are, um, I think, uh, combined or co-owners or something like that. Yeah. And so what is the name of the film again? So, because a lot of people asking about it. So, oh, you... <laughs> uh, To Be Seen. To Be Seen. Yeah. And it's on Ovid or Icarus. Yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah. Icarus is, is more institutional, educational film. So Ovid would be where people could stream it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I presume it's Ovid.com. Uh, maybe it's Ovid.tv. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so um, we're, we're, we're almost running out of time. Where, where do you see your field going? Uh, because digital is now... Uh, such a big part of 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 your art of photography um, the the fact that everybody has a camera now we ha you know we 're walking around with very powerful tools um, you know people aren 't buying i mean you obviously are, but most people are no longer buying cameras to take their holiday snaps or family snaps they 're doing it with their phone. Where do you see um, this discipline going with 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 all this innovation? Uh, and the sort of the democratization of it as well. Yeah, such a brilliant um, thing to discuss and talk about. It's bigger than the space we have here. I mean, but the, the phone itself, that it's pocket, that's that small size and, and creates really great images, most phones, uh, is like a wonderful sketchbook. So the more I think that we use our eyes and we're looking and we try to think, what makes a good image? Where should, again, where should things be in the screen? in the screen space and why in the frame what what's in it what's not in it what do you want to say i mean if you could take that approach to taking your pictures to me that'd be great what i see a lot of course is just random just quick shots and and so i i think there's a responsibility if you're going to make images and that that often we don't maybe see as much because it becomes so easy to take the image right you just yeah push that little button so so i think there needs to be visual education for people <laughs> to think about absolutely what, what do you want to say with this image what what should you be saying with this image and 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 we have almost too many images so yeah. that's that's this our problem with our attention economy uh where our eyes are in demand right and um we're, we're bombarded with images, mainly advertising, commercial images, commercial mm -hmm. messages. So that's something, of course, I focus on in my, my academic work. Uh, how, how do you create other sort of images? How do you get people to consume and think about and other images that aren't just about something that you should buy or you should eat, you know? Because images are powerful. Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, I, I mean, a picture, you know, to, to use a, a, you know, a cliche, a, a picture paints a thousand words you know, um, capturing that magical moment is so powerful, but so hard. Yeah. You, know? yeah. I, I, you have to train your eye and you have to be educated. You have to, you have to have an understanding what you want to say and why you want to say something. And I, and I think slowing down helps. Very you know? much so. Yeah. You, you should yeah. look, people often are looking like you have a camera and you look through the viewfinder and it was binocular scene. You looked through one eye and one eye was closed, right? And you, you, you really were looking intently or hopefully we're looking and again, trying to compose an image. And now you just hold up a, a screen that's not near your eye and it's, it's very diffuse and, and what is it even your borders or your boundaries. So, so I, I would suggest people kind of maybe slow down a little bit to make an image and think about it. You know, what, what is it is I'm going to, what's going in front there that I'm, that I'm going to take a picture of and why? Yeah. Awesome. Um, is there anything else you wanna you wanna add? Um, anything we've I think, missed? I think we or, covered a lot of ground. We've covered a lot of ground, but you know we still have a couple of minutes. Or is there a, anyone has a question for Alice? Um, yeah, comments. Yeah. There's been a lot of there's been a lot of comments while we've been doing this, but yeah, um, I haven't been yeah, able to yeah, watch them all. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and a, a lot of people who uh, are a lot of familiar faces on here as well. Jonathan, yeah. hello. 
and other people are there. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, what are your other passions besides photography? It's 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 visual photography, media design for sure. Yeah. Um, light. I'm 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 passionate about light, and uh, it it what makes things interesting to me. Yeah. And Look someone else. Someone else just asked, what was your favorite Giant Step or Groove Academy show to shoot? That's so tough. Um, definitely the, the, um, there was a show with, Bo the Bootsy show was amazing with, um, sorry, uh, Maceo and Fred. That, that, that was truly, uh, and I love Maceo and Fred, and I, I photographed them before in another, uh, another job. So that was truly great. The, the George Clinton show at the Ritz was tremendous. That, uh, that was like a big, big show, right? But that, that also, that went on for so long. And yeah, I think- as, Lucy, as they all did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th those two really stand out in, in, my, in my mind. Um, not that there weren't other ones that were just totally great. The Ginger Baker one was, was truly amazing. Yeah. And I'd, al I'd also add, um, you, you shot at the Red Hot and Cool, right? Yes. Yes. That was pretty, uh, that was pretty incredible. Uh, yeah. Smash and, and backstage at the recording, at the rehearsal, too. Uh, I mean, yeah, we want to see those. We want, I haven't we, no. seen those images yet. We I, want to I, see those. Yeah. Um, and uh, Smash asked the question, did you ever take any video footage when you were photographed at now? No, totally still. Yeah. Video didn't interest me um, until much later. It got better quality. And I wasn't thinking about sequencing the, 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 the images moving. I was really so concentrated on that single image. But um, I had a lot of photos of Smash, so I got to start scanning those. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Alice, uh, we, we, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, thank you for joining us. I mean, your your images are, you know, not just the stuff you did with us, but in general, iconic. You're a true artist, and I'm I'm really proud that you we we have a connection and we we have those moments that we can keep. Um, and um, you know, I I uh, really encourage people to go to the vault giant steps uh, dot, dot net slash vault and see Alice's images and see all the other great pictures from the other great photographers as well. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Thank you everyone who, all the familiar faces who came, Jonathan Jonesy, uh, Andrew, Smash. I mean, I'm missing everybody out, but um, thank you everyone for joining. And we're gonna be uh, back uh, next week. I'm gonna have Ben Pondol uh, with me, uh, who is um, a fascinating character who we've, work with for many years as well. So looking forward to that. Uh, everyone stay safe. If you're in New York, stay warm and everyone else be careful. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. Bye -bye. Take bye -bye. care, everybody. Bye-bye.